Um, given that it is a foreign uh, law firm conference, what we thought when we got together was that we would look at what Israeli companies, uh, concerns of Israeli companies when looking at IP overseas, uh, what issues they have to deal with in protecting the IP, uh, uh, um, obtaining IP, litigation, etc. So we thought we'd start firstly with a prosecution, secondly with how you secure IP and ownership, thirdly with monetization of IP, and finally with litigation. And I'll start with Danny uh, about patent prosecution in Europe. Danny. Um, so I suppose uh, one of the, the issues that face Israeli companies when f protecting their technology, uh, normally they would look to start off by patenting in the United States or filing a provision in the United States. I think something that Israeli companies need to be aware of is that when they then grow and develop into a, a bigger company and looking to expand, that they make sure that when they file that first application that they're making sure that they get their sort of bang for their buck and that that patent application is then suitable for prosecution throughout the world. So do not ignore um, Europe and China when they're making those initial decisions on, on filing patent applications. Um, you. I guess at, at, at the start of the process, it's, it's quite straightforward to get a, a first application on file. And perhaps the country in which you start doesn't make as much difference as the quality of what goes into that patent filing. Um, I think companies, certainly Israeli companies, are very aware of protecting their technology and making sure they get patents on file. But I think it's just to make sure, although I appreciate that, um, your know, R&D budget is sometimes, you know, quite tight. It's a startup. You know, it's a, a few guys in, in a shed with some laptops trying to um, save the world, um, and they don't necessarily have money to spend on a, a big patent por portfolio to start. But it's all about what goes into that patent filing. And later on, as I think we'll see, as you look at the life cycle of a patent, if you don't get it right at the start, it can come back to to bite you. I guess two, two, two specific points I probably would highlight is what, what I see is sort of little war stories. Um, one thing is when you get to filing in Europe, a, a, a patent that's been filed, say, in the US or, or somewhere else, um, it's very difficult or if not impossible to add anything to that. So what you put in the patent application at the start, you're pretty much stuck with. And Europe is very strict when it comes to trying to add new material to a patent filing. So you need to get that right from the start. And another, another interesting one, which is quite specific to the European um, perspective, is with priority filings. So when you first file an application, a, a US or Israeli provisional application, um, within a year you can file overseas or PCT applications which claim priority back to that initial filing date, um, but you need to be careful that you've made sure that between the filing of the initial application and the filing of the later applications, you get all your, your, your applicants in order. Um, and a, a sort of nasty story that came out of the European Patent Office recently, um, there's a patent uh, or technology relating to, uh, this is uh, my field's uh, electronics and software, but it's to do with um, modifying the genome to correct genetic d diseases. And the two leaders in the field, it's University of Berkeley and the Broad Institute, which is uh, a sort of partnership of Harvard and um, MIT. And in the US, um, Berkeley managed to file a provisional US patent first. Uh, the Broad Institute filed afterwards. And in the US, you have what's known as interference proceedings. So they, they kind of go to the US courts to decide who invented it first and whether or not there's any overlap. And as it turned out, um, I suppose, Michael, you can pick up on this. If, um, they, they, both were enabled, they both were able to patent the technology because the, the, technology, was, was, the technology in their patents was quite, quite different. Um, in Europe, it didn't quite work out that way because when they'd filed the initial US provisional application, it had cited lots and lots of inventors and lots of applicants, so a number of different universities. There was Harvard, MIT, Rockefeller University, and 
an Italian inventor was also cited on, on the application as filed. When they filed in Europe, they filed just in the name of the ultimate entities, which was um, the Broad Institute, Harvard, and I, th I think MIT. Um, now, the trouble is that in Europe, when, when this further down the line at um, opposition proceedings, uh, someone challenged this and noted that the applicant had changed between the provisional filing and the subsequent European filing. And at the time that the priority was claimed, the applicants weren't quite right. And on the basis of that meant that they lost the priority date, which also meant that intervening disclosures and had an impact on that patent, which mean, meant that that patent was invalidated. So a small bit of housekeeping in just tidying up the inventor names before filing made quite a significant difference. So it, it's, I think it's, it's just this sort of thing. It's, it's just some good practice um, at the start means that things down the line will, 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 will um, go more smoothly. Thanks a lot, Danny. I think we should stay in Europe for a while before we move uh, to further, further um, abroad. Uh, Michael, do you want to maybe give us a few words on the, uh, being, a, being the only uh, civil law lawyer in the, in the, in the room, at least in the, in the panel, tell us a bit about uh, copyright in France. I think you meant Christopher. Yes, Christopher. Okay. <laughs> Christopher, sorry, sorry, Christopher. Okay, I'm going to just say a few words. I'm an American lawyer who practices in Paris, as Anthony said. Uh, I'm not going to be giving you a course on French copyright law. I'd rather just give you two war stories the clash between the American copyright system and the French system, which in French is called droit d'auteur, or the author's rights. Uh, these are two stories I have from you, from my practice. Uh, the first story, the only thing you need to know about French copyright law is that there is a rough equivalent to the American works for hire doctrine. But since we're talking about France, there is always going to be a significant question around the rights of employees to receive specific and separate compensation for any invention or creation that is beyond what their employment agreement provides for. So in the first case, I represented an American group that was looking to buy a French company in the video game sector, where France has specific, uh, specific strength and is a world leader, companies like Ubisoft. And we did the due diligence. I led a team of corporate IP and IT lawyers. And in scratching the surface, when we looked at the due diligence of the French target that my client wanted to buy, we discovered that the most important and most successful of the games, the creator of that game had not validly assigned all of the rights to his company, which means, or which meant, in the case of our acquisition, that we actually had to sit down and try to negotiate a separate deal with the invent or the creator of the video game. He realized that he had us over a barrel. He was able to block the acquisition for months. We tried, we thought that this was only a question of money and if you pay someone enough, this is the American conception of life, if you pay someone enough, you can solve any problem. It turns out in this case, the creator of the game wanted not only a lot of money, but he wanted specific recognition on each and every copy of the game that would be listed on the app stores or on the internet. And my clients were unprepared to give him that recognition. We thought that giving additional money would get rid of this problem. And it turned out that the creator of the game was very well advised by a, a local French lawyer. And as a result, the acquisition actually had to be stopped. And we wound up licensing the game, but we wound up stopping the actual acquisition of the company. 
So the first takeaway, if you should ever deal with France or any other civil law jurisdiction in continental Europe, is these American-style <coughs> assignment of IP rights to the employer or to the company are actually not necessarily going to be valid unless you have specifically provided for separate compensation for inventions which fall outside of the employment arrangement. So be very, very careful. Uh, I'm speaking about the French-American context. Israel with a very vigorous technology sector. For those of you who might be counseling Israeli companies going into France, it's going to be exactly the same result. Second example also comes from the world of California video games. Uh, in this case, one of my clients decided to buy a video game which had been developed by a young Russian man. He was probably about 23 years old. The young Russian man devised or created a video game based on one of France's most famous literary characters. I will not say anything more. The American company bought the video game with a very simple purchase agreement. The developer, the 23 or 24 year old Russian, promised us in the writing, in the, in the agreement, that he had all the intellectual property rights, that he was guaranteeing the sale of his video game to my client. Well, my client started to commercialize or sell the game again online and through the Apple, uh, the App Store. Uh, and all of a sudden, the author of the well-known French literary character popped up and sent a cease and desist letter to California saying, how can you be commercializing this game? You never obtained any authorization from us to use this character. Well, the Russian developer, what he actually had done was on the bottom of this initial, the home page of the game, he had written, I have been inspired by, and he wrote the name of the author. And in the mind of the 24-year-old Russian game developer, he thought that this constituted sufficient intellectual property rights assignment to him, which entitled him to sell the game onto my California uh, video game company. And so we wound up in a two-year litigation. And the point I want to make in this case is second principle of French copyright law as opposed to the American system. In French copyright law, you have two different kinds of rights. You have what's known as the moral right which is the recognition as the author. This is a permanent, unassignable right, your recognition as the creator of the game or the book or the film. And then there's something called patrimonial rights, which are the rights to receive royalties, and those rights can be assigned. Well, my client in California, we wound up having a two-part litigation in France. On the one hand, we got sued for not having had the rights, the licensing rights, to exploit and to pay royalties to the author. But the more difficult part was we were also sued for injunctive relief in a summary proceeding where they told us to stop selling the game because moral rights cannot be assigned. We, or I should say the developer, modified the French character, which was a violation of the French author's moral rights. And as a result, we had this two-pronged, two two-year litigation, which we wound up settling for a great deal of money. But the takeaway here is that had my American client looked more closely at the rights they were buying from the Russian game developer, they would have realized that he had done nothing under French law. So I will conclude simply by saying, as an American lawyer in France, 
that the American copyright system is very powerful, it's very effective, but it actually can be ineffective and inapplicable in civil law jurisdictions. So be very, very careful with what you do when you aren't operating in the United States or in the United Kingdom or in other common law countries. Thanks a lot, Christopher. Um, I think it's a good chance to go to America and um, discuss the Alice judgment, which everybody's been talking about now for a long time, and the possibility these days of getting a patent for a computer program or a business method. Great, so the Alice decision was issued by the Supreme Court in the United States in 2014. Basically, about once a year, the Supreme Court issues a patent ruling, and unlike its other rulings, which are often very close, 5-4 rulings, they, the patent rulings are usually 9 nothing, 8-1, to one, something like that. Um, Alice w was no exception to that. But essentially what it did was it made it harder to obtain and to enforce a patent in the fields of software and business methods. Specifically, what it said is if you want to patent anything, it, it says simply in the, in the um, basically in, in the Constitution, that you cannot patent an abstract idea. And what the Alice ruling said is, if you're going to patent something involving an abstract idea, you must have something substantially more than that in the claims. This wasn't so, didn't seem so groundbreaking at the time, but in fact, it created a bit of a sea change, both in the prosecution side, which my colleagues here can, can certainly speak to, and in the litigation side, which I saw very directly and immediately. So in the first year or two, right after the, the ruling was issued, 2014 to 2015, we call this the, the sky is falling phase. Um, it became very, very difficult to obtain patents in the fields of software and business, and, uh, business methods. And on the litigation side, we saw a, a very high percentage of patents that had been issued already before the Alice ruling becoming invalid or, or rather being held um, as covering unpatentable subject matter. Now, initially, as I said, the sky was falling. 2016 to 2017, the, the pendulum swung back some more. And possibly that was because a number of the quote unquote bad patents had already been, been expunged from the system, so to speak. Also partly because on the prosecution side, I think the patent office began to issue better guidance as to how to avoid an Alice rejection, as it was called, and patent prosecutors became smarter and learned to adapt to, to the, new, the new normal, so to speak. Um, and, and on the litigation side as well, the patents that were being enforced uh, were, were in some ways immune because they were the better of the lot that had still been in there. Even more recently, as recently as this year, 2018, uh, we've already seen a further pullback from the Federal Circuit, the Court of Appeals that handles patent rulings, and at least on the litigation side, it seems that the Federal Circuit is treating some of the underlying issues as factual issues, which means they're harder to resolve early in the case. So if you're an innovator, um, if you rely heavily on your patents for patent enforcement for your livelihood, um, there's some good news uh, that, that's coming down the pike in terms of Alice, but it's still a big challenge. Uh, now to get an Israeli perspective, uh, Zave, we'll start with you. If you have a different perspective as, as an Israeli attorney who handles uh, this, and then we'll go on to get on as a client actually pays the bills for all the prosecutions. Trying to relate to what has been said here, I think that um, we heard a very interesting perspective that um, software companies are, um, have to consider, you know, copyright rights of software, Alice, and the preparation of your patents for uh, both Europe and the U.S. at the same time. I agree with Danny in, on this point. I, however, I think that um, there should be an industry-specific approach because there are other industries like medical where the focus should be the interplay with the regulatory pathway. For example, it's very difficult to go for you know 5, 510k and at the same time claim that your product is completely innovative doesn't sink well or if you're um, 
an Israeli company, and there are plenty of Israeli companies that are selling finished goods, whether in the retail space or in the industrial space, where trademarks are very important, in particular in China, where um, you know, there's all these notions of the Chinese copying technologies, but some of the problems have to do with simply the distributor, distributor taking your logo, for example. So an industry-specific approach, I think it's a very good approach when it comes to Israeli companies. Each one, you know, the software companies, it's about Alice is extremely important for them. One-on-one -on -one rejections they are facing every day. Um, considering Europe is very important. Copyright, you know, some people register their copyright in the U.S. as a collateral for loans, for example. But in other sectors, other considerations should be highlighted. I think, I think we'll get back to that point, I think, which is important when you talk about the Israeli companies selecting their foreign counsel to get somebody who's industry specific and knows the industry, the relevant industries. Gidon, uh, do you have something to add on this? And then we're going to keep you for the next point. So, you know, as a client, you know, when I'm, I'm, when I'm advising, you know, in-house here, it's, if I was going to say anything, it'd be, you've got to have a full portfolio. You can't just focus on one aspect of your portfolio. So having a, I mean, I guess it depends on the type of company you are, but if you are a software company, I wouldn't just focus on having a patent because Alice could invalidate that some way, in some way, shape, or form. You've got to copyright it. That's, you know, it costs nothing. And it's smart. Actually, I give credit for Zev to hammering that in me years ago. He doesn't even know it, but he did it. Um, so thanks, Zev. Um, but it's so, so you've got to look at it holistically. It's you've got to look at the countries you're, you're, you're interested in, the countries you're going to be interested in a few years, the countries where you're manufacturing. Uh, and, and, and it's got to be all encompassing. You can't just think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm in the US. And I, I, you know, I'm golden. It, it, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, it's, you know, China. Focus on China. They're getting better. So, yeah. um, so we can stick with you, Gidon, and uh, go to the next topic, which is securing ownership of IP rights. And here we have uh, in Israel, we have the, the copyright law, we have the patent law, and we also have those contracts that we all sign people up on, both for employees and for contractors, which say that basically anything they ever think of belongs to you. We've had the ISCAR judgment, which I think put to rest the issue of compensation, I hope, uh, for, for employee service interventions. We have a lot of uh, research funded at universities and the ownership issues there. How do you guys deal with this? We pray a lot. <laughs> I, I I'm glad can't to, tell I'm you glad how to much. Hear that. Yeah. I'm not sure, you know, in each country to the different relevant gods of, of patents and stuff. But you just got to, I mean, at the end of the day, you hope that you've got the right counsel that's advised you, right? You've got the right paperwork in place and that nothing goes wrong. You know, so, but, but there really isn't much you can do other than hope that nothing goes wrong. Because if you're working in certain countries, it's just a matter of time until something will go wrong. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm not going to speak much about it because I hope that it doesn't occur. And if I speak about something too much, it happens. It's like <laughs> babies sleep and stuff like that. You know, you don't talk about these things. But you just have to hope. I tell, usually when I'm on a panel and there's clients out there, I, I, potential clients for, for the firms, I say, you've got to choose the right client, the, the right firm to work with. And that's the most important thing in everything in-house counsel does, you've got, or any company does, you've got to choose the right people uh, to work with. And if you have, then you'll be fine, you know, 99% of the time. So we, we're moving to the last topic, so, so how do you choose? It's important for all of us to know. Uh, looks? No. Um, <laughs> it's a combination, I have to say. It's not just price, because I don't always use the, the cheapest firms. You know, Latham and Watkins is, is my go-to firm in America, not cheap. Um, but effective, uh, but it's it, it's really about it's usually about the person in front of you, right? Working with you. So I've you know I've worked with, we've worked with Zev, uh, we worked uh, 
apparently <laughs> we work with uh, Christopher. Uh, <laughs> sorry, we, uh, we work with uh, Michael and Danny and everybody. We'll work with everybody as long as they will. No, no, I know. We, we will work with anybody that we can have a good relationship with. That's how I, you know, if, I'm, if the relationship isn't good, it's not going to work. If the, the outside council, you guys come off sometimes as very arrogant. Don't. It's not a good thing. You know, in-house doesn't think highly of people that are going to come off arrogant. We want you to come off smart, but not arrogant. Uh, and it's that relationship. So I will, I've worked with a lot of people. If it's working well, it'll continue for a very long time. Uh, Zaev, so I'm going to pick up on, on that point also two points. One is as Israeli firms, and we see it, I'm, I'm no jumping topics, as, uh, advising Israeli clients, often you're giving, uh, in the licensing area, you're giving exclusive worldwide licenses to, to IP patents, etc. And the truth of the matter is none of us know the law in all the countries that we're giving, and there's mandatory patent issues, uh, copyright issues, as Christopher mentioned. Uh, and we know that in certain areas, you know, the, the, the council, you get, you get these questionnaires where a firm, in, often in London, will send you a questionnaire asking you for 20 questions, which they want you to do for $1,000, 20 questions about the legal situation, in, in, and they send it to everybody in the world, and then they know they're covered, which I don't think works for Israeli firms, and, and aside from which the law can change the day after you've done the questionnaire. Firstly, how do you advise clients on that? And the second question, which Gidon already addressed, is how would you advise your Israeli clients in choosing foreign counsel? For, for us, it's about teamwork. Um, you know, the elephant in the room in every conference is reciprocity, right? Which is the old style, I'll send you work, you'll send me work. Um, we kind of deserted this model years ago, and we're trying to create teams early on, including, um, you know, trying even at the early stage of assignments and who has the rights, etc., to consult with local lawyers. And a lot of times we ask them to do it for free, actually, because the startups cannot pay for it. And uh, under the concept that down the road, when you part of a team, it will pay off when, when the real thing happens. The real thing is, is a big joint venture, litigation, obviously, etc. position in Europe, etc. So this is our approach. It's, and we, we're trying to find people who will form part of our team. When, um, specifically for us, when we feel that it's a field that we've been engaged in for a long enough time, we'll try to have local resources. Um, as people may know, we have our own offices in the US and the UK, and we don't do all types of law there, but the things that we feel that we have the critical mass, we bring the talent from the Lathams and, and the other big firms to open up our own sh little shop in the specific jurisdiction. And for all other matters, which is let's say 80% of, of the matters that our clients are interested in, we basically work in teams with, and we, Initially and on day one, expose the, our counterpart in each country to the client. So it's a real team and not an associate relationship as it used to be in the good old days. Uh, uh, Christopher, do you, when, when you find for, uh, clients choosing you do, you, do you know the criteria that they're looking at? Well, more often than not, it's my Brooklyn accent, <laughs> uh, which continues to remain after all these years. W what I would say about international legal practice in an area as difficult and slippery as intellectual property, and maybe copyright more so than patents, because patents, to me, seem much more structured than what copyright law is. I can't, tell how many, I can't tell you how many times most of my business comes from California, although not from Gideon. Uh, so I can say what I'm about. To, no, no, it wasn't a put down. It's, I, 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 I can now say something, no reference to you. The number of agreements I get, intellectual property licensing agreements, technology licensing agreements, which are clearly American agreements, 
where they have changed the governing, clause, governing law clause from California to France and the jurisdiction clause from the courts of San Francisco to the courts of Paris. And they feel that this is localizing and being legally sensitive to international practice outside of the United States. To this day, I am always surprised when people send me, quote unquote, French law agreements, which are nothing more than knockoffs of what they use in the United States. <clears throat> I tried to give, I gave two examples of where, despite thinking that the American legal system is everywhere the dominant system and that it is a steamroller across all other countries. I gave you two examples of where there is another system with its own logic, uh, which actually resists very well the American legal system, at least in France. So when you expand, whether it's you come to France or the UK or anywhere else outside of Israel, uh, I don't think there's the legal arrogance here that there is in the United States, but it really, really is a good idea to invest the resources to understand what you can do in the country where you're going. That seems so obvious that I shouldn't have to say it, but in fact, I've been saying that for the last 25 years and having a very good time because people pay me a lot of money after they choose not to listen to me. Uh, but you can save yourselves enormous amounts of difficulties by doing just a little bit of homework wherever you want to go. I think it's a very good idea in theory, but it's not so easy with Israeli companies to persuade them to do that, and as we all know. Uh, Michael, I'm going to jump because we, it's time run, run, running out. Um, we, we discussed small Israeli companies taking on the big uh, multinationals in IP litigation. What do they do? How, do, how does David meet Goliath? So let, let me first just say, Zev alluded to this earlier, I, I do think that I have cracked the code on how to get whatever Israeli clients you want, which is just work for free. It works great. I'm telling you every time, every single time, um, it works great. But I, I, I will say just before touching on the, the small versus large uh, point, which I think is it's very important, to me the big takeaway in my experience here has been two words, cultural translate. That to me is really the key to working as an American or a foreign firm with Israeli clients. In my particular case, I'm an American trained lawyer who moved to Israel. I guess Yale lawyers moved to France and Harvard lawyers moved to Israel, but that's okay. Um, and I work in Israel with Israeli clients for a global firm on US IP matters. So generally speaking, people ask, do I keep US hours or Israeli hours? And the answer is yes. So that's, uh, that's, that's just me. But essentially, the key in my experience, and I think this is true whether you're an Israeli, uh, living in Israel, working with Israeli firms, or you're a US or other foreign lawyer working with Israeli companies, you need to be able to help Israeli companies translate their own needs into effective strategies for dealing with US or other foreign courts. And it doesn't just mean literal translation. It certainly helps to be able to, to speak Hebrew. I spend my days talking with engineers about operating systems and memory migration and, and uh, virtual machine monitors in, in Hebrew. But it really means culturally translating, taking the norms of Israeli businesses and rendering them appropriate to the Israel to, to the I'm sorry to the U.S. or other foreign legal systems, and vice versa, translating the complexities of issues like Alice or copyright law into language that Israeli companies can can really understand. Now, specifically on the the notion of how can smaller companies, whether they're Israeli or or others, take on big companies? How can you win the the David versus Goliath battle? And there are a number of strategies to that. It's impossible to cover them all. I, I would just point out one growing trend. And let me, maybe I'll just survey people in the room. How many of you in the room have heard of the notion of litigation funding by third parties? OK, so actually about half, which, which sounds about right. Um, in a 2017 survey, 36% of law firms 
said that they were using litigation funders, whereas only 28% said so in 2016. And half of those who said they were not using litigation funders said they expect to in the coming years. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the notion in about 30 seconds, the idea is it used to be law firms, and it still is, but law firms would often take cases on contingency, which means the client wouldn't pay for anything, but if and when the client won, the law firm would take 30%, 40%, 50%, sometimes even more, uh, of the results. Now, uh, that, that still is ongoing, but over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been another source of that funding that started to come online, which are third-party companies, funds, hedge funds, private equity funds, who essentially treat lawsuits as investments, and they will be the ones supplying the funding for, for the litigation, either paying the lawyers on an hourly basis or sharing the risk with the lawyers in, in some way that seems to work out well for everyone. This wasn't allowed initially. It was contrary to certain common law, um, sort of, uh, I guess, old proverbs against being able to, to take ownership as a third party in another person's lawsuit. Now it's pretty much uh, across the board a, a, a norm. And it's a creative way, I think, that really helps, in particular in Israel, helps universities, helps startups, can even help venture capital funds in Israel, and can even help mature companies finance their, their litigation. So I think it's a, an interesting approach that's growing in influence. Um, thank you, Danny. Um, first, if you can relate to that. And secondly, you can't get away without talking about the unitary patent, about the German Constitutional Court, about Brexit. No way somebody from England can do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess just to pick up on Michael's point on um, David v. Goliath litigation, um, I've got two, uh, when I'm not here in Israel, on panels, I'm representing lots of startups, and most of them are, um, most of them are investing in their technology in order to attract investors or um, looking for, as part of an exit strategy, but I've had two recently, one where They've got a, a granted patent, granted many years ago, and they've come up against a big, well-known um, household name that's infringing the patent. And we've had to be quite creative to find ways to get them to the table. And I, I think part of that has been getting, getting some litigation funding in place, but a part of it has also been how we've played a game with the other side to Th threaten infringement, but get them to settlement discussions. So we landed up having meetings with, with the other side across the table where it's been, um, we're looking at a license deal as opposed to going all the way to full-blown litigation. And the other is, uh, I suppose, more of a, a startup that was used to raising funds to um, fund the, their R&D and have now realized they can raise funds to fund potential litigation and that's working quite well for them and they've they're targeting a, a big company that's infringing a patent that they have and filing lots of patents to cover that with the aim of um going after them um yeah on to um brexit and the unified patent unified patent court i mean for those of you who don't know um sorry you, you've all obviously heard about brexit but <laughs> Uh, unified patents, I mean, at, at present you can get a European, the European Patent Office administers a system that allows you to get Europe-wide protection, but it's not quite a, a single unitary patent. Uh, and there's probably, it's probably taken about 40 years to get to the point where we're now on the cusp of a, a, a unified patent, which would mean a single patent covers all of the parties in Europe that sign up to it and would mean that you could sue as a, uh, as a patentee, uh, you get an injunction across the whole of Europe, you wouldn't have to sue in each, each individual European country, so obviously cost effective from that point of view. Um, from the point of view of the patent holder though, um, all your eggs are in one basket in the sense that if the patent gets challenged and revoked, then you've lost your patent across the whole of Europe. Now, despite the fact that the UK has um, apparently voted to, to leave the European Union, um, the UK government is still going ahead with ratifying the Unified Patent Court and Unif Unified Patent Treaty, which means that it will likely come into effect in the UK at some point, probably come into effect in Europe, probably 
in January 2019, so that's not so far away. And that means that companies have to start thinking and preparing for that. Um, the fact that apparently three months later the UK will leave the European Union doesn't seem to have, <laughs> have stopped this happening, but uh, there's so much political will for the Unified Patent and Unified Patent Court to come into effect that it seems like, and there are legal loopholes to enable Brexit to happen and the Unified Patent to come into effect, that it will likely come into effect, which means I think that Israeli companies need to start thinking, factoring that into their strategy. So at the moment you could have UK patents, French patents, German patents, and European patents that cover those various jurisdiction, jurisdictions. In the future you'll have unified patents that will also cover that, and there'll be some overlap between these. And I think you need to think quite carefully about whether you want a unified patent, a European patent, or a German, UK, and French patent. And you could have all. It, you don't necessarily have to choose, but you need expensive, yes. <laughs> um, so you need to make sure. So certain, certain of your technology, you might want individual um, country-specific patents, maybe the weaker patents, where you might not want to spend much on them, and also you would be concerned if they were to be um, subject to a revocation action. But for your sort of bullet patents, you might think more um, aggressively about a, a unified patent or an EP patent that's opted into the Europe. Um, they, t they tell us that we have to finish. Um, I, think, I think what comes from the discussion is the importance of the cooperation between the Israeli and the foreign or non-Israeli council uh, because, the, because the different fears, the different cultures and the different legal issues and uh, hopefully we've given some of the points we could probably carry on talking for an hour or two but uh, there it is. Thank you very much.